Hey guys, um, this is the start of the notes on Unit 3 about dynamics. And whenever we say dynamics, just so you know, dynamics right there, that's just a fancy word for forces. That's what this unit is all about, is forces. Um, last unit, if you recall, was kinematics. And kinematics was all about the study of motion, meaning position, velocity, acceleration, those kinds of things. Dynamics, on the other hand, is not about motion itself, but the causes of motion, meaning why is it that things move in the first place, and I, or, or don't move for that matter sometimes. And I think what you probably got out of the reading is the answer was uh, forces. Forces are the reasons why things move or don't move, right? Something moves when you push or pull on it, or something pushes or pulls on it. And so actually that's pretty much going to be our definition of what a force is, which Sounds like kind of a hokey definition, right? If we say it's a push or a pull, uh, it's one of those really hard to define terms because it's just so fundamental. There's a lot of words like that we're going to hit in physics, one of them being like energy. Honestly, nobody has a good definition for energy. Force is going to be the same problem. So experientially, it's a push or a pull. And of course, the other thing that we ought to say about it is, semicolon, forces cause acceleration. That's, that's what they do. Okay, so if something is accelerating, then you can say that there is some kind of a net force acting on it. All right, now I'm being very careful there to say a net force, right? Um, there's actually all kinds of forces acting on all of you right now in the room. You are sitting on stools. Those stools are holding you up, resisting the force of gravity pulling down on you. So there are at least two forces acting on you. For that matter, if you want to get really technical, there's gravitational forces of attraction between any two objects with mass. So that means you're all experiencing miniature gravitational attractions towards each other all around the room. Okay, and so, but net, none of you are really going anywhere. You're not accelerating in any direction. So that brings us to uh, the idea of equilibrium here. Equilibrium is a condition where the sum, that's a sigma, the sum of the forces acting on an object is zero. All right, if the sum of the forces is zero, that means that the object does not tend to accelerate. Um, as we're going to show in a little bit, um, we've got this formula from Newton, which is F equals MA. Well, if the sum of the forces adds up to uh, zero, then that must mean that the acceleration is zero. If you're thinking, well, couldn't the mass be... No, no, the, the mass could not really be zero. That's kind of a meaningless thing. Everything effectively has some kind of mass. Um, but all right, fine. So if the sum of the forces is zero, that's called equilibrium, and that's going to be a relatively common situation you're going to come in, uh, come across. Okay, now uh, before we get into all the really technical things like drawing force diagrams and breaking forces up into components and stuff, I think it's useful to begin to talk about the types of forces that you're going to see in the unit. And these are not all of them, but these are, these are some important ones. We'll add another one in here later on, which is centrifugal, but we'll get to that later on in the unit. Um, applied force. That's some dude is pushing on it. Okay, so that, that's what that would be. Or it could be like a fan is blowing on something or whatever. I'm sure we could come up with lots of other examples of an applied force, but basically it's some external actor is pushing on it, some external agent, okay? All right, I don't think we need a definition for that. Gravitational force. In your reading last night, you read that gravitational force was the same thing as weight. In other words, it's mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Um, you always have a gravitational force acting on you as long as you are near any other substantially massive object. So you are near to the Earth, therefore you experience weight due to your proximity to the Earth. All right, so that force of gravity, that weight, is always pulling down on you. Um, if you recall, this is separate from your mass. 
However, let's say you're talking about the situation where you are in free fall, where you have like, here's an object, not touching anything, right, just sailing along through the air. If it's just flying along through the air, not touching anything, not experiencing significant air resistance, then the only force acting on it is actually gravity straight down. And based on this equation right here, if the only force acting on it is mg and the sum of the forces equals ma, that means that your acceleration is g. Okay, as long as, and it, it, notice the mass cancels out, right? So as long as there's no other significant forces like air resistance acting on some object in free fall, then that means the acceleration is just g. Fine, so gravitational force then is going to come up all the time, like just about every single problem. So it's important to know that when we say gravitational force or weight, those terms mean the same thing, and what they mean is mg. You'll see a few problems where they, unfortunately, in my opinion, will refer to it as w for weight, which is not especially confusing, but you do need to remember that it's it stands for mass times gravity, right? It's not, the weight isn't going to be like W and then times G again or something, right? So W is mg. Okay, normal force. You also saw this one in your reading. Quite a bit, probably. Um, a normal force is the supportive force supplied by a surface. I'll say that again, but not try to write it because my handwriting's not too great and explain everything. So it's the supportive force supplied by a surface. The supportive force supplied by a surface. So if we have a flat surface with an object resting on top of it, that object is experiencing weight, its weight downwards, there it is, but it's clearly not falling. There must be something holding it up. If its weight were the only force acting on it, it must be moving downwards because based on our definition of force and equilibrium, right, there must be some other force balancing that one out in order for it to not be accelerating. All right, that other force is usually going to be the normal force. Okay. Um, now, I've drawn a situation here where we have a flat surface. You will see others later where, holy cow, it's a sloped surface, and you put an object on there, and, and there it is, right? Okay, now gravity is still straight down. Check that out, right? Gravity is always going to be straight down. It always points towards the center of the Earth. However, the normal force is going to change directions in this case. Actually, in some sense, it's not really changing direction. The normal force is always going to be perpendicular to the surface. So if you had, say, a vertical surface like this, and you're pressing a block against it. Here's you applying a force to it. That's an F. If you're pushing against it like that, um, the normal force supplied by the surface would be in the exact opposite direction, as it turns out. That's supposed to be an N, guys. There we go. Uh, because it's going to be perpendicular, 90 degrees, to the surface that supplies that normal force. The word normal, in fact, means perpendicular. It means 90 degrees. Okay, if you need a minute to process that, let me, let me pause there for a second and let people think about that a little. Um, the main terms that we've hit here, uh, in my opinion main terms, would be the idea of weight, right? Gravitational force, which is mg. That's a big one. The idea of a normal force, which is perpendicular to a surface and supplied by a surface. Okay, and then the other really big definition up here actually that we're going to come back to all the time is what equilibrium is, right? You're always going to end up doing a sum of forces. This is going to come up so often in these problems. And if the sum of the forces is zero, then that's what we call equilibrium. And it may actually be sometimes that you have an equilibrium along one axis, but not along another one. So we'll start dealing with breaking things up into different axes later on. Okay, so after that brief kind of review thingy, this would be a great time for you to ask questions if I were here. Oh, sigh. Okay, tension force. 
Um, you probably are familiar with the term tension, which relates to things like ropes. That's exactly what this is. If you say that there's a tension force involved, then that means that you're, you're talking about ropes holding something up. So say you have, I, I wish I had a better place to put this, but say there's the ceiling, right? Here's a rope, right? There's a rope, and it's holding up something really heavy. All right, now, in this case, you would not say the thing holding up the hanging object uh, is the normal force because it's not resting on a surface. It definitely has gravity pulling down, and it's definitely not falling, but it's not resting on a surface. So we'll need to describe what's holding it up in some other way, and that is by saying that there is tension in this rope. All right, now, based on what you know about ropes, tension actually pulls in kind of like all directions simultaneously, right? This tension isn't just pulling up on the object. This rope had better be anchored pretty well to the ceiling. Otherwise, what's going to happen is it's going to pull down a chunk of the ceiling with it, right? So there's probably some kind of anchor screw that goes up into the ceiling, whatever. The point is the tension pulls in both directions, right? If you're playing tug of war and you, uh, uh, this, maybe that's not a great example, um, okay, I, well, I guess what we have here works. <laughs> it's pulling down on the ceiling just as surely as it's pulling up on the object that's hanging from it. Okay, so tension pulls in both directions in a rope. Okay, the tension does not always equal the weight. We'll do some examples of that later on, but here's, here's a quickie. Let's say, here's a pulley, right? All right, that would have been rounder. I'll hang something light on that side and something heavy on this side. All right. Um, we're mostly, when we deal with pulleys, going to deal with what are called ideal pulleys. And in an ideal pulley, the tension on both sides is going to be the same. We'll discuss reasons for that later when we do, when we do more pulley problems. But for an ideal pulley, the tension on both sides is the same. Um, if the tension on both sides is the same, it can't be equal to the weight of both of those objects, right? That can't, that can't be right, because those weights are different, right? One we said is heavy, one is not quite as heavy. Okay, and so that means the tension isn't necessarily going to be equal to either one of those weights. All right, so is it equal to the smaller one or the bigger one? Actually, neither. It's equal to neither of them. Um, Again, we'll get to those when we get to pulley problems later on, but as far as what you need to know about tension right now, it's, it's the force that you get in a string, and key idea, it pulls in both directions. All right, and then we have friction. Friction is going to come up like just about all the time. That being said, you won't deal with friction in tonight's homework. You might not even deal with it in the next one. Um, but the friction force is always going to oppose attempted motion. That's something that you should write down about friction. Friction opposes attempted motion. There's actually three kinds of friction. They all do the same thing. They oppose motion or attempted motion. The first kind is called static friction. Actually, at this point... Go ahead and go to video part two, which is going to elaborate on friction.